my cousin sent me a video of a clock in action. TikTok. Yeah. Uh, but it's an old fashioned sort of clock where the gears are on the outside. And it was made of wood. And it was made by a man called Bruce Aitken. I read a book once. I don't read very often, but I read a book once by Darva Sobel. Uh, who I hear on the BBC World Service every now and again, actually. She's got a spot on there, so uh, I often get a surprise. You know, uh, you read a book by someone, and, um, and suddenly you hear that person, you sort of think, oh, this is a small world. <laughs> well, it's not that small, you know. Maybe the BBC World Service read her book and said, do you want a spot, you know. So, um, actually a digression, just for the moment. Speaking of that cousin, this will take you a while to work out what's going on here. But um, my father-in-law loves the Spitfire aeroplane. He has a love affair with it. And my wife bought him a Spitfire book for Christmas, just gone by. And it was by a man called John Nickel. Uh, he's very famous, actually. Uh, I actually remember the moment when he and his mate were shot down uh, over Iraq and they became front page news uh, across the world. Now, um, it's a long story. They were taken hostage by Saddam Hussein. Uh, but anyway, that bloke, John Nickel, you know, people like that, they make me wonder what I've done with my life. <laughs> Seriously. You know, I've never been exceptional at anything. You know, not that this is about me, it's not. It's probably about you, for all I know. But, um, what does it take to even become a Royal Air Force pilot in charge of a piece of machinery like that? That, you know, can fly four foot off the ground in all sorts of terrain, going over little hills and things like that at 8,600 kilometres per hour, <laughs> dropping bombs along the way. Look, I don't know all the stats, you know. Maybe it's 600 miles per hour, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I think I think those planes, they've got all, sort of, all sorts of computers in them. They go, ooh, ooh, ooh. And there's a house, you know, a house with a roof and a chimney all that sort of stuff, and I think the plane goes over the chimney and it keeps going at 600 mile an hour. And, um, and you know, John Nickel and his mate were doing that one day, and boy, they were pulling some G's going over that house one centimeter above that, that house. But what does it take, you know, to even get to a position? Um, I mean, it's amazing that I can even drive my car. And that's just a Kia. <laughs> yeah. It's just insane what people can do. And um, on this particular, oh, I've digressed from the clocks. And how does David Aitken, for example, this other bloke, uh, work up the skill, the woodworking skill and the engineering skill to make this clock? And that I saw TikToking. Um, I'll describe that in a minute. Uh, all these people, they're they're doing something, they're doing things um, right to the edge of their craft, you know? a little bit like uh, Bach writing a fugue uh, or Little Richard singing Long Tall Sally, you know, you can't even, you can't change one note, <laughs> it's just amazing the way it is, you know? um, and even to make that tornado aircraft, yeah, this is that thing, I think I think it was the Mozart movie, Amadeus or something, where I read it, where, um, where whoever, the, you know, the royalty guy, the nobleman who was funding Mozart or whatever, he said, too many notes, you know, and the Mozart said something like, which notes would you like me to change or take out, you know, and, and the fact of the matter is, is there wasn't one note you could take out without making it worse, and by the time... 
aeroplanes, for example, like this tornado aeroplane that this guy, John Nichols, and his mate were flying over Iraq one day before they before they got a heat-seeking missile up their tailpipe, which blew the back off their plane and they had to eject. Apparently that's painful. Um, and is it, uh, my nephew was saying when that happens, um, oh, look, he could be wrong. He said, maybe they can't fly again after that because of all the G-forces you're pulling just by ejecting. Might do things to your body and should never eject again. I don't know. But it's not, you know, it's not just... Uh, you know, Batman in his Batman, Bat Batmobile, you know, sh it's not too much trouble and just keep fighting, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, these things, um, these are people who are creating things and doing things right to the edge of their crafts. Um, so, yeah, even to make that tornado aeroplane, uh, you can't, I I'm sure, I don't know anything about engineering, or really, it's amazing how many things I don't know anything about. Um, but I imagine that they put the wings and the body and the fuselage and uh, the tail wing thingies and the tail um, and all that sort of stuff and the wheels and everything through wind tunnels and everything and they got, they got the curves just right. They got the size of the thickness of the wing just right. Every little thing, even the bombs on the bottom would have been sort of aerodynamically shaped by trial and error in the wind tunnels and all that sort of stuff and they would have used physics and all that sort of stuff and and and, um, and you would look at that aeroplane and you would say oh if you were an idiot you would say oh maybe put that wing another degree <laughs> but it would you know as soon as you did that if you're an idiot suddenly there'd be more turbulence behind and uh, the plane wouldn't be going so well you know so yeah uh, to a certain extent, to a certain extent, I know perfection's a very tricky word, but the aeroplane's just perfect the way it is. Yeah, and I'm sure pilots of such aeroplanes, um, yeah, they would almost fall in love with their beauty. You know, to a certain extent, there's a beauty in it, uh, and um, and there's there's beauty in life, and there's beauty in this clock I was seeing going tick tock. Uh, and, um, and and people could fall in love with these things, and probably they'd, they'd probably to make them would be even better, you know, to fly them. I've never flown a clock, <laughs> but um, I was reading a book by Dava Sobel. Did I mention I heard her on the BBC World Service? She was doing. She takes a spot on the BBC World Service, doing some. Thing about planetary motion or something, yeah, science thing. I listen to those things. Um, not, I can't appreciate them, but I can almost glimpse the fact that some people could. You know, like I listen to things about. I like listening to science and all that sort of stuff, and I listen to things about planetary motion and black holes and all that sort of stuff. Like that. I'm not understanding all of this, but I can see there's something amazing in it. You know, and I see. You know, um, I, I was on the 18th floor once in my office in Collins Street in Melbourne, and then and uh, a military helicopter came by right outside my window and shook the windows. I went, oh, that's awesome. But not awesome like the way they use that word these days, but awesome the way they used it when I was young. Like, and cockatoos. You know, would you change anything about those guys? You know, I'd change their heads. You know, they're ugly. <laughs> they really are. They're a fright. I, you know, um, they're not pretty. But if you if you don't look at them too closely, they're magnificent. If cockatoos weren't so numerous, we've got thousands around here. I mean, I'm, I'm, there's an ocean over there, but I'm not showing you bad luck. Right there, all the, um, they've got the lawn life-saving clubs out there with all the kids and they've got them all on the surfboards over there. Um, all the little kids in their pink tops. Um, learning how to be lifesavers, I think. It's, all, it's, a, it's quite a routine. And we've got a rainforest up there. Um, so we've got all this stuff, you know, the perfection of nature. Would you change a thing? Not today, I wouldn't. Um, 
Now, they're cockatoos, but um, if they were rare, they're not rare, but if they were rare, they'd be world famous. Maybe they're world famous anyway. A magnificent looking thing. Until you get up close. You know, my mother-in-law um, feeding them bits and pieces, which she shouldn't do. Uh, because they have to learn to forage for themselves. But you get up close to them and then a <laughs> nasty looking thing. Like seagulls, you know, they're horrible. <laughs> seagulls are horrible creatures. Yeah. Um, I heard Prince Harry yesterday. Well, no, I didn't, I read. And he said, I believe that um, we are all coded for compassion and all that sort of stuff. And I said, have you seen it? You know, are we really that different from seagulls? <laughs> they're nasty bastards, those things. They're rats of the sky. You know, they're beautiful. Like sometimes I see a seal flying, I say, that's beautiful, you know? Um, oh, well, sometimes I see, you know, footage of the Nazis marching <laughs> through the streets of Nuremberg or something. I say, that's beautiful too, because it's really, you know, that's machinery, that is. That's engineering, that's amazing. It, 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 I love the Nazi uniform, by the way. It, it looks striking. I like everything about Nazi sort of... Um, uh, you know, like, um, you see cigarette cases from the war and all that sort of stuff, and, and we've got the little swastika on them and everything, and just the design is brilliant, you know? They're really classy. Um, get up close, though. <laughs> it's not so nice. A little bit like a cockatoo. Anyway, so, Dava Sobel, and um, I, I read a book by her once called Longitude, and I glimpsed, because I, I never do much more than glimpse, at what's amazing about the world because I don't have the brain power um, but I've got the brain power just enough brain power to glimpse it you know the good things that are all around the joint and um, you know, I, I grasped I glimpsed the fact that before John Harrison came along he's a clockmaker see I'm wheeling around uh, back to Bruce Aitken here um, John Harrison was a clockmaker and he solved, essentially, he said, well, he did. He solved the problem of longitude. Now, what was the problem of longitude? Well, the problem of longitude in history, and that was the name of Darfur Sobel's book, by the way, Longitude. The problem with longitude was, um, for all how great all the ancient cultures were, Greece, Rome, the Carthaginians, famous sea farers and all that sort of stuff, and the wondrous, amazing Pacific Islanders, the way they took off from Southeast Asia or wherever they took off from and managed to find all those islands in the Pacific. Amazing, you know, even I can't do that. And, um, and all the great seafarers in history, the Chinese in 1492, did I get that right? If I did, it was a fluke. Um, and 1412, it might have been, um, the year that China discovered the world, you know, uh, so on and so forth. Um, for all that we think, wow, you know, Jason and the Argonauts, they knew how to sail a boat. Uh, they never knew where they were on the open sea or the open Mediterranean, as the case may be. Uh, because there, there's no way to look at the stars and figure out where you are in the world in the middle of the night when you can't see the land on a dark night even if it isn't cloudy longitude wise you can tell where you are latitude wise because you know it's the way the earth spins it's all really tricky anyway so for centuries and centuries and centuries since time immemorial um, Ships have been running into the sides of continents and so on, and islands. You know, it's been in the middle of the night, everyone's just sailing along and crunch. And the reason for that was they didn't know where they were. Longitude-wise, they were pretty good. Latitude-wise, they said, I know exactly where I am. Latitude-wise, but I don't know the hell where I am. Longitude-wise. And then John Harrison went, oh, and they, uh, the, what was it, the Royal Society, you know, Isaac Newton and all that sort of stuff. Um, they said, listen, we've got to solve this because we're English. You know, 
The Egyptians didn't manage to. The Ethiopians didn't manage to because they were landlocked. <laughs> they didn't need to. Maybe they had to sail around a lake. Yeah. Um, maybe they had to sail down the Nile and, um, and give the, Egyptian, the Egyptians a bit of what for, yeah, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but anyway, the English being the English, yeah, we've got to sort this out. Yeah, another bloke down the street probably said, why? You know, if the Greeks didn't see the need, why do we need to? It's because we're English. <laughs> ah, these barbarians. And, um, and anyway, so a lot of the best minds in town, and I think that included Isaac Newton. I'm listening to a podcast on calculus at the moment. That's an amazing thing too. Oh, that's a whole other story, but this, these are... These are people, you know, like Isaac Newton figuring out calculus, and there was the other guy too who did the same thing independently. And, um, I've forgotten his name. Isn't that always the way? <laughs> Whatever his name was. He's re- I know his name, but I've forgotten it just for the moment. Um, oh, whether it's, you know, making a tornado aircraft, or creating calculus, or working out, or discovering calculus, or harnessing music, you know, discovering music, because music was around before humans came around we just discover these things mathematics we just discover these things um we don't invent them there's certain things that you know god made if you want to put it that way you know uh um, like geometry was already there we just had to discover it um we didn't have to we didn't invent you know the sphere um well that was another thing i was listening to on a podcast you know, archimedes you know who um, measured the surface area, no mean feet, back in those days before calculus, uh-huh, yeah. um, and um, measured the surface, surface area of a sphere, and then he put that sphere into a cone, a conical sort of box in his mind, you know? Um, you know, like an ice cream cone, and the ice cream cone was the minimum... Um, the minimum sized cone that you could fit a sphere in snugly with a roof on it that just touched the sphere. So the sphere was touching all sides, you know. And, and, um, and then he measured the surface area of the cone, including the top. And I think he found it, I can't remember exactly, but I think um, the surface area, er- er- the surface area, <laughs> the surface area of the cone was something like uh, yeah, two thirds the surface area of the, the surface area of the sphere was two thirds the surface area of the cone, and that was exactly a fifth when he plucked his lute uh, in music. There was a relationship between music and geometry, shapes, the stuff that was, you know, what he what he could tell was a nice wave in the air going into his ear because it sounded consonant or whatever, um, harmonious, you know, it doesn't matter whether you like a fifth in music or you prefer rap music, it's not about what you like, it's about the fact that it is a regular shaped wave going into your ear, and he said, that's beautiful, I can't believe it, there's a connection between this, uh, between a, you know, a sound going into my ear and the mathematics involved in that wave. And and an exact and the way a sphere fits into a cone. That blew his mind. He put it on his gravestone. You know, that's how amazing that was. Um, and this is this is the beauty in things, you know. Um, just the stunning, mind-blowing beauty in things that I can only but glimpse at, and I never quite. I, I almost got that one. I can see why he put that. You know, I almost got that one. I could see why he put that on his tombstone, Archimedes. Um, anyway, so speaking of that sort of thing, oh, now that is perfection. That is perfection because the sphere and the cone were in his mind. You can't make a perfect sphere and, and put it in a perfect cone. But you can do that in your mind, and this is what's mind-blowing. You know, and the same thing with calculus. 
uh, when Newton and the other bloke, <laughs> whose name I can't remember, sorry guy, <laughs> he was a genius too, um, when they invented calculus, they essentially were able to calculate things that weren't an approximation, but that we also can't replicate in uh, real life because you know, calculus is all about you know, a perfect parabola, you know, and the area underneath, and what's the volume of that, what's the area of that area underneath, and what's the equation of that line, and all that sort of stuff, you know, it's just amazing. Look, it doesn't matter what it's all about, but what it's all about is, it's, it's what's behind the fact that this iPhone that I'm talking into got invented. And if you like your iPhone, all the stuff that I'm talking about is amazing, including mathematics, but if, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you, you know, if you like me, and you're a genius on <laughs> on um, and talking into uh, a YouTube podcast and you know uh, distributing your large ass and you and you're swept away by you by your own brilliant insights on the world, um, yeah, you know, and and you know how to discuss the merits of Donald Trump getting impeached or not and all that sort of stuff and you go and you wax lyrical about all that and all that. look you know I've seen all these people on Facebook and I can actually spot where they're getting it all wrong um, and you devote your life to talking about geopolitics and politics and all things like that and you're talking all that stuff in your iPhone but you're never wondering how the iPhone even came to be and the sheer genius of the people behind that you know what you're doing is you're operating in a tiny little bubble of everything out of all the bubbles there are in the universe that you could expose yourself to and you're taking certain things for granted like how the hell is this iphone even recording me right now and um and putting that up onto the internet whatever the hell that is what's behind all that you know and and to understand all that you'd probably have to go back to all this stuff i'm talking about most of which I don't understand myself. You know, mathematics and technology and imagination. Now, because apparently Newton, for example, um, to get to where he had to get to, he had to use imagination and art. There was an art to it. Now, uh, just crunching numbers was never going to get there. You know, um, so it's absolutely amazing. These people are amazing. Um, you know, um, when... Bruce Aitken makes his clocks. You know, uh, uh, he'd have to imagine them, does he, before he starts carving them? They're made of wood, you know. They're, I saw a tick tocking, you know, and the little gear levers were going tick, tick, and it was just, it was all hand carved, I reckon. And you could see the, and I, I saw it, and the little sort of ratchet thing was just ticking away on the cock, cog. Um, Everything's on the outside like an old grandfather clock. No, like uh, a clock I was almost going to mention before, a wondrous clock, K1 and K2 or whatever their names were, by John Harrison. I'll get back to Darva so well soon. But there was these amazing clocks that solved the problem of longitude. I'll explain that afterwards. But I got sent a video of a clock made by Bruce Aitken over in England. I think he's in England. See, I could even be wrong about that. And um, tick, tick, and and the little gears were going past the little ratchet lever thingy, just beautifully, like snug, nice, gentle. You wouldn't change a thing, just like a Mozart fugue <laughs> or a boat's no, or a, anyway, um, or a little Richard. Long tall Sally. Now, um, I think Mozart heard on a podcast the other day that Mozart didn't tend to write his own fugues. He tend to rearrange, tended to rearrange um, uh, Bach's. Yeah. But I did hear, I've been studying a couple of fugues by Beethoven um, via podcast, not quite understanding what the hell I'm listening to, but almost glimpsing them, you know. And it's amazing, like the clock or the tornado. These are the amazing things. How did this iPhone come to be? And is there a thing I would change about it, you know? It's, it's a work of art. Okay. Cockatoos, they're ugly. 
<laughs> they might be beautiful to each other though. <laughs> it's really like being out to dinner. There's a couple of cockatoos on the next table. And they've got little baby cockatoos that just come out of the egg, you know, <laughs> and you're with your wife. You've got your own little baby. You know, you've got your own little kids on your table. And you look over there and you say, see those cockatoos over there? They think their baby's beautiful. <laughs> Whereas our babies are beautiful, you know, that's ugly. Have you seen a baby cockatoo? My God, that's an ugly thing. <laughs> You'd chuck it back in the egg, wouldn't you? Yeah, anyway, um, but, um, Darva Sobel <laughs> wrote a book called Longitude. And it was about that moment in history, you know, where Englishmen uh, decided to win a prize. Uh, the Royal Society uh, in England, uh, and I think maybe Newton was heading that thing up, uh, put out, you know, they offered a prize to anybody who could solve the problem of longitude. And the long and short of it was um, that um, most people didn't think outside the square and they kept trying to find the sol a solution in the stars and um, finding a solution in the way the planets were dancing up there and the moon amongst the stars and all that sort of stuff, you know. And, um, but they were looking in the wrong place. And a man called John Harrison, he, you know, he'd studied his Greek. <laughs> but no, he, he, you know, he'd studied things and he knew, and everyone, I think a lot of people knew that if you had a perfect timepiece, the clock, if you like, uh, that you could take on a ship, you could always know where you are as long as that thing kept ticking. You know, leave London at midday, you know, on Christmas Day. Um, and as long as you kept that clock going, don't let it wind down, you know, keep tapping the pendulum. I don't know how you keep the thing going. Um, see, that would introduce a problem, I reckon, just tapping it. Maybe not, you know, not enough to worry about. I don't know. The point is, and people did know that if you could invent such an amazing thing, there was, uh, people were back with sundials and crappy ideas of clocks and all that sort of stuff. There was just no way. But anyway, um, if you could invent a clock, you could leave London uh, at midday, yeah, or Plymouth, as the case may be, because we're going to talk about Captain Cook in a second, and um, you could leave Plymouth at midday on a Sunday, and, uh, and you know, as long as you kept that clock going, you would always know what time it is in London. Um, so, if you went sailing and sailing and sailing and all the way over into the South Pacific or something, and you looked at your clock and you said, hey, um, Banksy, <laughs> um, it's midday in London. And Banksy was, uh, you're kidding me, looking up from his botany, you know. And uh, oh, it's midnight here, clearly. Yeah, I don't know how clear it is to work out that it's midnight here. The other way around. Um, hey, Banksy, it's midnight in London. Oh, really? Well, look at that. The sun is high in the sky. It's midday here. We are exactly halfway around the earth. Halfway around the world. And Cook could then say, ah, I get it. Well, Cook was a scientist, he knew all about this stuff. They were doing transits of Venus and all sorts of things. It's just a whole other level, people like Captain Cook and all that sort of stuff. They're just amazing, you know? And, and the, the people he had on board and all that sort of thing. What the hell's going on there, you know? Like some people say, um, you know, like when Captain Cook first came in touch with um, indigenous Australians here, uh, I absolutely, um, I absolutely acknowledge that there were things that the Indigenous Australians were up to in their minds and in their imaginations and in their, what they were doing and all that sort of stuff that would have blown Captain Cook's mind if he could just have understood it. Um, but equally, there were things that Captain Cook was up to um, that would have blown the minds of the Indigenous people too. And, um, you yeah, know, the fact that he wasn't even over here to discover Australia or anything like that specifically. He was over here to measure, you know, in the South Pacific and all that sort of stuff, 
he, you know, one of his major reasons for coming over was to measure the transit of Venus. And I don't even know what that means. Yeah, I think it's maybe um, the moon crossing, you know, passing over Venus or something. I don't even know what the transit of Venus is. You know, maybe you know the moon comes sliding across the sky and touches Venus and um and then goes past it and then by the time and then you measure how long it took this is amazing stuff why was captain cook even doing this you know there are very good reasons i think they're try, trying to triangulate something or something they had people they had someone here in the south pacific they had someone over in canada they had someone in botswana for all i know um all making the same measurements to try and work out what were they trying to work out? I don't even know. I think they were trying to work out the distance between here and the sun. Why are they even doing that? You know, and the indigenous Australians, they would probably say this, uh, why are you doing that? You know, because, um, and then, you know, had the indigenous Australians uh, been able to describe some of the things they were up to, Captain Cook would have said, why are you doing that when you could be measuring the transit of Venus? You know, and the indigenous Australians might have said, well, there's no real need to measure the transit of Venus if you know what's really going on in the universe and what really is important. Because if you measure that transit of Venus and all that sort of stuff and have your fancy hand, your fancy pants clock working out what your longitude is, you know, who cares if it's midnight in London and, you know, 10, uh, what, 2 p.m.? <laughs> here in Sydney, which isn't even called Sydney. Who cares, you know? Um, you're wasting your time, Captain Cook, you know? So there's that, you know? And equally, you know, there might be Buddhists somewhere saying this and you're wasting your time. Maybe they wouldn't, you know? Maybe, who knows, you know? But the point is, there's all these different people doing amazing things. I actually don't understand what the amazing things the Indigenous people are up to. Otherwise, I'd make an episode about that. But I've had a, I've, I've glimpsed what John Harrison was up to, the guy that made that clock that I'm going to talk about. And if you haven't guessed yet, a replica of that clock, well, how could you guess that, was on Captain Cook's ship and helped make him a great navigator, the greatest navigator who ever lived, even despite the clock. And that's a big statement, you know to say that Captain Cook is the greatest navigator who ever lived, because there's been a few navigators. That Chinese general, uh, sorry, admiral, <laughs> who took those um, Chinese ships across to Djibouti, wherever he took them, um, back in 1492 or 1412, or whatever, whenever that was, the year that China discovered the world. I've seen that book, I've been thinking I need to buy that one, I haven't read it yet. Um, yeah. There's been some great seafarers in history, Jason and the Argonauts, Paris, when he was kidnapping Helen and taking her to Troy or whatever happened there. And once those have all the great seafarers in history, um, the Carthaginians, yeah. they're the only ones I can think of, but there's been a few others. <laughs> anyway, but the thing about John Harrison is he made a clock. You know, that was so beautiful in an engineering sense, so beautiful that it went TikTok. <laughs> no, but it was an amazing thing because Captain Cook, Captain Cook was able to take a replica of it, you know, a next model, a next version or whatever, maybe it was called K3 for all I know, and um, Captain Cook was able to take that clock on his ship and know where he was in the, in the world, the first ever great seafarer um, to be out on the open ocean and know where the hell he was. What an amazing thing that is. When you think about it, the history of sailing and Captain Cook was the first one and uh, and he knew his longitude and latitude and that clock by John Harrison was an early, was, the, was a GPS system and we're using essentially the same sort of um, technology if you like or conceptual technology um, to um, in maps on my phone here. My phone is 
a descendant of John Harrison's clock, maybe, you know? Um, and the TikTok these days, you know, that's a cesium atom in a satellite somewhere, but it's all the same idea. Yeah, it's unbelievable, the beauty in that. And meanwhile, people who feel like geniuses, like me, you know, we, we, we are at such a primitive level, um, discussing relationships and politics and all that sort of stuff and how, oh, I've worked out the politics of the world and how all the politics of the world fits together. And I'm speaking my genius into this iPhone but I may be doing that without any knowledge of what's gone into the iPhone itself in the first place for me to even be able to waste data <laughs> by distributing my largesse. Yeah? Um, there, there's, there's this thing in the history called standing on the soldier, shoulders of geniuses. No, standing on the shoulders of giants. Isaac Newton said, I'm sta you know, when I make all these amazing discoveries, he acknowledged, you know, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants in order to make these discoveries. He was acknowledging that great people went before him, you know. And in his case, you know, everyone who had, yeah, um, the giants who had invented you know, or discovered most of mathematics, you know, from all sorts of places, from India across to Babylon and all that sort of stuff, and whoever had to, you know, thought up decimals as a good way of doing things, and whoever had thought up algebra, you know, the Persian or the Arabic guy or whoever it was that did that, and you know, he acknowledged all that sort of stuff. But then he was a giant on those, on those, on the shoulders of those giants, and Newton became a giant on the shoulders of those giants. But most of us uh, fleas standing on the shoulders of giants because we're not actually giants ourselves you know these geniuses from time to time like Isaac Newton or whatever and John Harrison an engineering genius you know and um yeah oh if you didn't guess John Harrison invented a clock that was able to reliably keep time and it was an amazing thing now in an artistic sense and, and an engineering sense too um Bruce Aitken has made such, he makes such clocks too. But it's almost like an artistic, but beautiful engineering woodwork, the likes of which John Harrison probably wasn't all that good at because he was doing it in metal. But whatever your medium is when you're an artist, uh, but it's not just art, it's the art in engineering. Art colliding with engineering. Um, John Harrison's clocks were a work of art in metal. And um, and these clocks I was watching by Bruce Aitken, tick-tocking on my iPhone, however that image got to me, that blows my mind. It's just, anyway, the fact that my cousin in London was able to send that video to me. Yeah. There's trillions of hours by geniuses going back hundreds and even thousands of years that made it possible for my cousin to send that video to me on my iPhone in high resolution. Just amazing. I don't even know. You know if I knew how that happened, I'd be, I'd be blown away. Anyway, so, you know, Bruce Aitken clock, he must have spent a lot of time. You have to be a craftsman. It's a thing of beauty, just the wood. He would have picked all these beautiful wood and all that sort of stuff and carefully carved every notch in every cog and all the levers and everything and it had pulley systems you know with strings of some sort or whatever but it was all natural fibers and all that sort of thing and i was watching a thing of beauty just watching this i'm not making too much of it i don't you know i am not making too much of it it's an amazing thing just to see something like that and i go wow that's beautiful and i'm sure if i went to greenwich and saw john harrison's original clock or whatever still survives I would say that's the thing of beauty too. And when I look at my iPhone, um, my, my own face excluded, I think that's the thing of beauty too. Just the actual, it's not the, it's not the selfie that's beautiful. It's the actual phone that's beautiful. And, um, and, uh, and a tornado aircraft, a thing of beauty. You know, you wouldn't change a thing. A bark fugue. Um, 
Little Richard's long tall Sally and the turn of Little Richard's voice. You wouldn't change a thing. Uh, these are all things of beauty. Yeah? Um, and even the pilot, you know, the pilot and then um, the navigator or whatever in the um, tornado flying that aeroplane that day, that tornado, there was a famous moment in modern history when um, that aircraft got shot down over Iraq. Uh, even um, the training that went into those pilots, uh, they were elite, elite warriors of the sky. The training that went into those human beings to um, manage that aircraft in the sky and fly at 600 miles an hour uh, just over the treetops, you know, skimming the skimming the tops of trees and dropping bombs on things. Just amazing. Not very nice, probably, you know, for the people who've got bombs dropped on their heads, but amazing still and a thing of beauty you know, at the same time, even as you know, people were getting blown to bits. But, you know, it's still a thing of a, a thing of wonder. I think I've um, I've gone to 41 minutes. I can see that on my phone. 41:26. Do you know, even the little clock on my phone, that's probably being co control being controlled by a cesium atom vibrating in a satellite up in the sky. Is that not an amazing thing? Oh, did I leave anything out? I think I talked about everything I know. <laughs> I'll finish off there, but you know. Um, I did mention, didn't I? Look, I'll finish off by saying that, oh, coincidences, I like those too. That, this one, I'll just finish off a little bit of a coda for a bit of fun, you know. Um, my uh, my father-in-law, he loves Spitfire aeroplanes. I mentioned that earlier, I remember that now. And um, my wife bought him a book by that same pilot who was flying that tornado who got shot down over Iraq and got taken prisoner by Saddam Hussein. One minute he was a warrior, an elite warrior in the sky. And, you know, a minute later he was ejecting and, you know, and he, and then soon enough, he was all grubby down in the sand, suddenly a very, very human person again. Nothing, you know, from a great warrior in the sky, really, the, you know, like the knights of old, except much, much, much better. And suddenly, He's being surrounded by what you, what were probably half, you know, well, warriors, but just half feral compared to, you know, like just on a lower, lower level, you know, people that, it's amazing they even learned to, you know, the best thing they've learned is how to fire a, a rifle, not command a $50 million dollar tornado aircrafts at 600 miles an hour skimming the treetops it's different I don't, i'm not disparaging anyone who knows how to fire a rifle it's great but it's different it's like the difference between an fa-18 hornet and a boomerang you know sitting on the tarmac they're both amazing um but they're kind of on different levels you know they're both weapons the best weapons oh don't worry um the F-18 Hornet is lower than a boomerang because it can kill more people. So it's not as good. You know, depends who you are and what you are. All right. Uh, but anyway, my wife, um, she bought this book on Spitfires. Now, as it turns out, it's the same guy. You know, who wrote, who was flying that plane. And that same guy is a mate of a cousin of mine in London who... Um, I said, who has had a replica book, another copy of that book, signed by the guy, John Nickel, and that's on its way over to my father-in-law. Now, he's going to be wrapped. Yeah? It's a small world. That one's a small a case of it's a small world. I like that. I like the coincidences involved in there. Um, my wife obviously didn't know that my cousin knew the guy that was writing this book, and she just saw the book in Dimmick's and said, wow, that looks like a good book, and bought it for her father. And, um, and at the same time, I happen to know someone who, know, who knows the author over the other side of the world. It's a small world.
that'll do 44 minutes the longest episode i've ever made but i was in a good mood i'm here by the ocean and it's nice and cool today after a bit of a hot spell i've got the ocean over there and i've got a rainforest behind me it's lovely down here in lawn